constant of the intra-seasonal um, uh, sea surface temperature um, variability, which was quite surprising because uh, along the Peru here, we are very close to the equator, but we could even quantify it. So we quantify to 20 percent. And this is another um, another uh, study I made, and this one I looked at the uh, interannual variability with extreme events in the um, Atlantic, tropical Atlantic, uh, extreme events, warm events in the equatorial regions that are uh, called the Atlantic Nino, and along uh, the Benguela cooling system, uh, warm events are called the Benguela Nino, and what we thought. Um, one admitted theory is that you have some fluctuation in the wind and you will have a signal that will propagate along the equator, cause the Atlantic Nino there, and then it continues its way, propagating along the coast, and it will cause the Benguela Nino. But following this scenario, the Benguela Nino should appear after the Atlantic Nino. And if you look at the observation, it's a reverse. The Atlantic Nino starts first, finishes first compared to the, uh, the Bengala Nino starts first, finishes first compared to the Atlantic Nino. So we um, used the Croco model to uh, build a tropical Atlantic simulation, and we put some perturbation to represent the uh, surface wind perturbation. So we put them in the west of the basin, and we look at the propagation of the signal along the coast. And we will get uh, along the coast here in the Benguela, uh, in function of the depth here, we can get a warm event that extends to uh, 200 meters in the depth. And here on the x-axis is the time. So you see that this event lasts a, a little bit more than three months, okay? And so it's when we put the wind only here in the western part of the basin. But if I put the wind in the whole basin, I see that the Benguela Nino appeared just a little bit before. So this is without the, the coastal wind, with the coastal wind, without the coastal wind, with the coastal wind. You see this shift in time, and this explains why the uh, Benguela Nino starts before. There is an action of the local wind, and then we went a little bit further and we saw that this local wind that we start the event before, it will also stop the event before. And in fact, this wind will be directly connected with what's happened in the equatorial region. So there is an ocean connection through the propagation of the signal, but there is also an atmospheric connection that linked the two regions there. And that we use a Croco model to uh, reveal this connection there just playing with sensitivity experiment. So now going on the methodology. So as I said, uh, we need to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, uh, which are the uh, fluid mechanics equation for the water adapted to the ocean water. We're going to have an equation for the salinity, for example. And uh, the problem is that we don't know how to solve this equation. Mathematicians do do not know how to solve this equation. And so there is a price which is named the Millennium Prize. If you are able to solve this equation, you can win $1 million. So maybe you won't spend the week here and maybe you are going to try to solve the equations. Okay. But in the meantime, if you decide to stay here, the way we, we, we the thing we do to solve this equation is that we are going to make hypothesis for our ocean dynamics and making those hypotheses, we will end up with equation that we can solve. So those are hypotheses are the hydrostatic uh, hypothesis, which means that in fact, if you look at the ocean, the um, horizontal scale are way bigger than the vertical scale. It's true in the physical domain, we have only, let's say five kilometer deep ocean but we have like thousands of kilometers in the horizontal direction. And it's also true for the processes, how the current change uh, in the horizontal and in the vertical. So we do this hydrostatic approximation in which there will be an equilibrium in the pressure force in the vertical and in the gravity. And in that equation, we are going to remove the variation of the vertical velocity 
and we, we are going to estimate the vertical velocity just by mass conservation. If you take one of the one boxes uh, of your model, everything that goes in will will have to go out. So with that, you can you know what's going from the lateral boundary condition. You will know that what's going up and down. So it's the vertical velocity will be a diagnostic. Then the second hypothesis is incompressibility. When you're going to take your little volume of water, if you go deep in the ocean, it won't compress. Okay, it can change its temperature, its salinity, but the volume will be conserved. And the last approximation is called the Boussinesque approximation. It's like we say the density of the ocean can be considered as a constant, but not in every terms of our equation. When we are in an equation that uh, deals with um, the gravity, we keep the real density there that can vary. It will vary with temperature and salinity, but everywhere in the other equation, and in particular for the pressure gradient, we're gonna put this constant, with, which is rho zero. It's around 1000 kilogram per meter cube. Okay, just to give you an idea. And so these are the primitive equation now. So don't be afraid. Um, we are not going to solve those equations. Croco has already been written and it's going to solve them for us. But it's quite important to understand what Croco is doing because sometimes the model crashes, you don't understand why. And so maybe by understanding a little bit better of the equation, you can understand why the model is crashing. So um, we have uh, seven equations here. So the first two equations are the momentum conservation equation. So it's the equation for the currents. The first equation is for the zonal currents that is commonly named U. And the second equation is for the meridional current V. So the first term here is a tendency. It's how the current will vary in time. It's very important because we, if we don't have that, the model will stay in an equilibrium with the initial condition and nothing will change. So that's when you do the modeling, it's kind of the uh, most important term. And this term is equal to one, two, three, four, five terms. So the first one here is the advection. It's a non-linear term where you have a product of velocity times velocity. So that's why we say it's a non-linear term. And this term um, is um, the process of advecting. It's that you have a current that will advect some properties. And this uh, process, which is non-linear, for example, uh, explains in the atmosphere the difference in the size between cyclone and anticyclone. So if you see, we have the southern anticyclone close to um, uh, the uh, southern hemisphere in the tropical Atlantic, and the anticyclone is quite big. And sometimes we have depression coming, which is in the other direction, and they are more, they are significantly smaller in space. And this is this term here that explains this asymmetry between the terms. The next term is the Coriolis force. The Coriolis just translates the fact that the Earth is it's rotating, okay? And so we have this parameter F that is named the Coriolis parameter. And um, it's if you have a current V, okay, here, you are going to create some U, okay? You see that if you have something, if you have a V current there, you are going to create some U. And so um, the Coriolis force tends to uh, deflect the current to his left in the southern hemisphere and to his right in the northern hemisphere. Um, the next um, term is the pressure gradient. And if you do um, only the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient, you can have an equilibrium that is called a geostrophic equilibrium. That's why when you have an anticyclone, you have like a big bump and the current is just turning around this big bump, just like an eddy, a very big eddy. 
The two last terms are the horizontal and the vertical diffusion. Um, tomorrow morning, we are going to do an exercise where we are going to solve um, the um, evolution of temperatures that will be only linked to the horizontal diffusion. So horizontal diffusion is the same as you put some sugar in your coffee, you don't do anything, you just wait. And in something like 100 years, the sugar will be uh, spread evenly in your in your ticker. That's why they invented spoon because the diffusion it's really a slow process, and so it's better if you turn your coffee. And you also have um, a vertical diffusion here, and the only difference is that the coefficient uh, is not the same in the horizontal in the vertical because the scale are not the same and the processes behave differently. Um, there was a third equation. Uh, I'm not going to the uh, uh, meridional equation. It's the same. For the um, hydrostatic equation, as I said, it's an equilibrium with a, a gradient of pressure and the gravity. The continuity equation is for an incompressible fluid. It's a mass conservation. Everything that goes in your box has to go out somewhere, either on the top, the bottom, or any other side. So this was this is what this equation means. And as there is no uh, evolution for W, the vertical velocity, um, in that uh, framework, W will be what we called a diagnostic variable. You know U and V, and then knowing this. Uh, two uh, fields, you will be able to compute W. So you use a diagnostic, you compute W. So W is a diagnostic variable as opposed to U and V, who are what we call the prognostic variable. We have an equation for the evolution of U. We have an equation for the evolution of V. It's a prognostic variable. Then we have traces. So um, very commonly in ocean model, we have temperature and salinity as traces. And it's um, the equation look really like the same as the momentum conservation. There is no uh, Coriolis force that you apply on the temperature. So we have like the tendency, the nonlinear terms and uh, the, diffu the two diffusion terms. And to link our temperature and salinity together, we have the equation of states uh, in which the density will be computed through a state equation. Um, and so you get uh, salinity, temperature, and pressure. And with that, you can compute the uh, density equation. And then uh, to solve our uh, those uh, seven equation, we will need, as I said, the initial condition. So you will have to go and sample your ocean to get as many observations as you can. I used to say the word filling your swimming pool. You imagine that your area is a big swimming pool with a lot of uh, tiny cubes inside, and you have to fill your swimming pool with initial conditions. And you will have to prescribe some uh, boundary conditions. So for the boundary condition, we will have uh, the condition at the surface where here uh, the fluctuation of the sea level that is noted eta will be in fact the vertical velocity at the sea level. You will have the action of the wind at the surface with the action of the wind is named the wind stress is how the wind affects the ocean and can create some currents. So the zonal wind stress is 2x, the meridional wind stress is called 2y. Then we will have, we will heat our ocean with the sun and we will also um, uh, make it colder through evaporation, for example, and this constitutes a heat fluxes action on the ocean. So this is one boundary condition for the heat flux, and we have a one boundary condition for the salinity that has uh, the difference between evaporation and precipitation. At the bottom of the ocean, we still have uh, evolution of our topography, which is uh, the vertical velocity. So in the CROCO model uh, that we are going to use this week, we are not going to make the bottom of the ocean moves, but it can through um, 
the evolution of sediments, which is what we call morphodynamics, okay, but in our case, at the bottom of the ocean, the vertical velocity is zero. No flux can enter the bottom of the ocean, and you can have nothing that going uh, from the bottom of the ocean. Then we have our currents that will um, uh, have a stress going on the bottom of the ocean, which is a bottom friction. Uh, so these are um, the equation. So everything that is at the um, bottom condition will be computed directly by the model. And for the surface condition, uh, we will have to prescribe to Croco the wind stress, the heat fluxes, and the evaporation minus precipitations. It will be our boundary conditions. So this is kind of a, a recap of what we learned this morning, is that in this black box, you solved the primitive equation, not the Navier-Stokes equation. So the Navier-Stokes with a little bit of hypothesis. And if you know the uh, ocean state at one time, you will be able to compute the ocean state at time t plus dt. So dt could be 15 minutes, could be one hour, could be 30 seconds, depending on what you have what you are going to ask your model to do. So if you say one hour and then you compute uh, 12 or 24 time steps, you're gonna have one, um, one day of simulation. But if you put your uh, time step at, let's say 30 seconds and you compute 24 time step, you are only gonna get 12 minutes. So more you increase your time step, less calculus the computer is going to do for you. But we will see uh, Wednesday morning that you can't choose the value of your time step as you want. There are some limitations that are um, associated to the equations that we are going to solve in our grid. Okay, so we, we are going to do a hands-on session on that and you will understand why um, this uh, time step cannot be just chosen randomly, okay? And so uh, we need to, to um, do to compute the time step at um, t plus dt. We need uh, the surface forcing that we just have seen in our boundary condition, which is the wind, um, the heat fluxes, and the difference between evaporation and precipitation. And we will also put our uh, boundary condition on the north, the south, the east, and the west to, to know which fluxes are entering. Um, and so uh, the boundary condition will consist on the same prognostic variables that you have in the in your equation. It will be the current, the temperature, the salinity, and the sea level at the boundary conditions that what you are going to create, you are going to create those files that the model is going to read at each time steps. Okay. And there are also some uh, model parameters, uh, which is uh, here the diffusion coefficient, for instance, okay? So you will have to choose your diffusion coefficients. But in fact, you are not going to choose them. They will be chosen for you uh, in the model, depending on your resolution, everything. It will be solved by the model. And in that sense, it's um, the, the fact that um, we need to solve this um, a parameter, it's called the turbulent closure. So if one day you heard this word, it means like finding those parameters, okay? And so now I'm gonna present a little bit of history of the CROCO model. So at the origin, CROCO model was not called CROCO. It was, it was called SCRAM. And then it was uh, renamed and uh, improved at the UCLA, California um, University. Uh, and uh, it was called the uh, ROMS model, Regional Oceanic Modeling System. And then at one point, there is a, uh, a way to do like a zoom in your model. We call it a nesting that has been developed and use some tools that are called AGRIF. And at one point, this model was separated in two different branches. And in France, we developed the ROMS AGRIF version that contained everything to make a zoom within your grid. And more recently, 
the ROMS AGRIF model was uh, kind of merged with all the models to include more uh, capabilities, more modules inside. So in now we can solve uh, the non-hydrostatic equation. So if you do the non-hydrostatic equation, you will be able to solve what we call internal waves that we couldn't do it with the ROMS AGRIF version before. So the uh, non-hydrostatic was um, inspired from an, another model that is called Symphony. Um, now we uh, are also including a multi-resolution um, where you can change different domain, different resolution and make them communicate. And although there is this uh, sediment model that was coming from a model that was called Mars, and the sediment model is called Mustang, that what I said, it's a morphodynamics where the bottom of the ocean can change during your simulation. And altogether, um, they created one model, which is named the Croco model, which is a coastal and regional ocean community model. So the philosophy of the model, it's like, it's a, a community development. It's a continuously um, developing. So even for this class, there are sometimes some bugs that I identified or improvement in the script uh, that are done. So if you download the code of Croco, maybe six months later, there will be a new release with uh, bugs correction or new capabilities inside. Uh, so in fact, there will be a release in a few weeks. Okay. And in this class, we are going to use uh, all the developments that have been made for this release. So once you will be home and you want to download the official release, it will be the 1.3 that will include everything you have there and a little bit more that will be developed in the next days. But as I said, it will be released in a few days, weeks maximum, less than one month. Okay. And so there is uh, help and support and a forum associated to Croco. So if you have question, you can put your question into the forum. It will be answered on the forum. You can also see the questions that have been asked by previous students that can help you to find what's wrong or why don't you understand something. Okay. Um, and the Croco model goes with some tools really useful tools that are coded in MATLAB. They are not, they are named the Croco tools and they uh, make, it's an easy way to create all the files that your model will need, like the topography of your model, creating the grid, creating the boundary condition, the surface condition. It's will. Really, it's very, very easy to get the first files, but maybe you will be interested in uh, a special product to force your system because you want to use a special uh, wind data set that develop in Australia, for example, and you will have to adapt those tools to the four things that you want. So it's an easy tool, but it's adapted like for everyone. It's not specialized exactly in what you intend to do with the model. And so uh, it's a really adapted to uh, IRD because IRD it's an institution, a research institution in France that works in different countries in the world. So the uh, Croco and the Croco tools are really portable. You can install them in a, a Linux or a Mac system. Uh, here we are going to work on a supercomputer that is uh, the operating size system is Linux. So we are going to, um, the installation is very simple. You are not going to do the process of the installation during this class. We adapted some scripts, especially for this supercomputer, but all the scripts are, you will see that we didn't do much modification to the script. It's quite easy to make the model run on even your own computer. If you are not really demanding in terms of the size of your grid, it can run on your laptop, okay? And um, the Croco model offers a lot of um, um, modules and stuff. I'm gonna put the module and stuff directly. Um, 
The one that I talked was the nesting capabilities that is using the agriff where you can put um, grids inside grids and have how many child grids as you want, depending on your on the on the power of your computer, of course. And so this is this new multi-grid um, development where you see this is a uh, coast of Bretagne in France, in the north uh, west of France, where you have all these grids that will have a very fine resolution. And then you can have like communication between grids and you can have forcing elsewhere for the boundary condition. And so it's a new um, development for the Croco model. Uh, in the croco, what I call croco and more, uh, you can put um, the river inputs. That's what we are going to do on uh, Friday morning. You can also imagine that you have a source of a tracer, like um, pollution somewhere. It's a passive tracer. It's not uh, linked to the density of the ocean of nothing. And you can do, you can check of the evolution of this tracer. You can have a wave current interaction. So there is a WKB model or a coupling that has been developed with a croco. So you can couple croco with model like WaveWatch 3. Mm -hmm. There is what I mentioned before, the uh, current sediment interaction morphodynamics with the Mustang model. There is also a USGS model. Uh, there have been a lot of efforts in developing the ocean wave atmosphere coupling. Uh, so we are using a coupler that is named Oasis that is uh, developed in uh, Meteo France in, in France in a lab named Serfax. And with these tools, we are able to um, make some connection with a wave model or an atmospheric model. So two way connection where the ocean uh, influence the atmosphere and the atmosphere influence the ocean in return. Uh, there is a biogeochemistry model that are directly included inside the croco. It does not need to do any external coupling. So you have very simple model like NPZD and it grows with more complexification, the bioabus model and then the PSCES model. So next week there will be a class on uh, the PSCES um, biogeochemistry model for Monday and Tuesday, for those who will be there for the second week. There are also some coupling with some Lagrangian models. Ma Lagrangian means you're gonna put some floats in your, in your grid and you can see where your floats are going. And as your floats are going, they can sample the temperature, the salinity and the current as they are going into your, your numeric ocean, okay? And that you can do it online putting some floats inside Croco. So you have to rerun Croco with some float inside, or you can do it offline. You have the output of your Croco, you know the currents, and you can uh, look at the evolution, initialize some floats somewhere and look at the evolution. So that's what you are going to do on Friday afternoon. And there are also some ecosystem model with like lava spreading and how the lava goes. Okay, so here I had a little bit of example of um, some simulations that has been done with the Croco model. So this is uh, the safe configuration, a very um, famous configuration developed by Pierre Penven with a zoom here that encompass the um, South African coast. And here, this big, uh, there is a big current going along the coast. And you see this here, it's a temperature. So you see the signature and temperature is the angular current. There is a very high resolution zoom to see um, the, to study the dynamic of the angular current. Here, it's a zoom of the Gulf Stream, very, very high resolution where you see very um, specific details of how the um, Gulf Stream will uh, spread eddies. And here you see there is a zoom there that has very, uh, very fine scale resolution here. Um, I'm gonna go to uh, that. So here it's um, study of the uh, internal tides and eddies in like a very, um, 
uh, unrealistic or unrealistic simulation where you have like a rectangular simulation and you look at how this um, filament and eddies evolute. So you have uh, um, the rip current here. So this is a photo of a beach as uh, I guess it's around the coast of uh, Africa, but I'm not 100% uh, sure. So this is how it looked like in the observation and how you can model it with Crocosair. So this is a, a, a wave interaction uh, with a, a croco uh, coupling uh, stuck with a wave watch tree, I guess. I'm not familiar with this research, but here on the slide, you have the name of the people that uh, did the research and you can access to uh, their uh, result if you are interested. Okay. And so, um, as I mentioned before, the you have, with the Croco model, there is a library of a lot of tools that help you to pre-process your uh, data to get the forcing fields for your model. But it will also be possible to do some visualization of the output with a nice tools, which is kind of nice just to check how your outputs are. But then when you are going to do some real analysis of your a specific question, you are going to develop your own script to analyze the output. And so there is a development. So uh, the Croco tools um, were written in MATLAB and MATLAB is not a free software. So there is um, a development of the Croco tools that are translated in Python. It's, um, I think it's already uh, available on the website, but it does not contain everything. And it's still in improvement and in bugs correction, uh, I would say every day. And so you have um, the possibility to activate some keys inside the model to get the online diagnostics. For example, if you look at the equation of temperature, you can decompose the equation and save what is due to horizontal diffusion, what is due to vertical diffusion, what is due to nonlinear terms. You can decompose everything and analyze all these terms separately. And there is also an XIOS facility. It's a way of saving the model output and it's very, uh, cost effective and convenient to choose. You don't have to save everything inside your model. Maybe you are really interested on one part of the model that you want to solve at very high resolution. And the XIOS was kind of enter the Croco model. And you just have to say, I would like this field, very high resolution there, but this field not so high resolution. And you can pick and choose what you want to say. Um, and so if you are running Croco and you need help on the Croco website, you just tap Croco model on your browser, you will find the website of Croco. There is a documentation um, part where you can have a lot of information on the equation if you are very, if you are very interested into the numerics of the equation. And there is a forum that I was talking about with the question of the users and uh, the one that are answered, okay. And so now I'm gonna just review uh, the program of the class. So today we had our introduction to regional modeling. Um, and our first end of session will be uh, connecting to the Lango cluster. So the Lango cluster is a computer cluster that is here at the CHPC in uh, Cape Town. So we are going to connect to the supercomputer and we are just gonna test if MATLAB is working. And so that's what we're gonna do uh, before the lunch break. Uh, this afternoon, we are going to make the first step of um, the preparing our uh, con first configuration. So we are going to make our first grid. And the thing is you can choose any region of the world that you want. There will be only uh, two um, conditions uh, for your region. The first condition will be choose a region where there will be a river because on Friday morning you will put a river inside. So you will be doing um, three simulation 
before the river. So you don't have to have your first simulation that will contain the river. Our first simulation will be a climatological simulation, which means that at the boundary and at the surface, we will use monthly forcing, will be an average of the month of January, February, March. So we have basically the seasonal evolution. So that's the first practice. And then we are, um, so, we are going to do a second different simulation on Wednesday, and you're going to have a third simulation on Thursday. But one of those simulations has to include a river at least. Okay. So this afternoon, we are going to make our first grid. So any region you want, I'm going to present a little bit more of what's inside Croco and the Croco tubes in terms of what are the directories and what does the directory contains when you download them from the web. Okay, we're going to do a quick Linux and NetCDF recaps. Don't worry, I have prepared some, um, some file like those one that have been distributed to you, uh, which, no, it's not those one, it's those one. Um, you will see this afternoon. It's a recap of the Linux commands, the basic command, um, the software we are going to use, and some details on the CHPC uh, cluster uh, characteristic. Okay, so we will see that this afternoon. Uh, so this will be the example of uh, the tutorial that will be given to you. So in a few moments, we will have our first tutorial, which is create the working environment and every steps are explained in details. So you are going to be the first one that are going to test that. So I'm sorry if you find some English mistakes inside the writing, but please tell me and I'm going to correct them for, for the next summer school. Um, tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about my dream swimming pool. Okay, and when you have a dream swimming pool, there are people that uh, split some very hot coffee inside the swimming pool. And so we are going to solve a diffusion equation. So you are going to discretize my very long swimming pool into boxes. And we are going to solve this equation, which will be uh, the numerical aspect one of the class. You will see the grid and you will see the processes. In the afternoon, we are going to uh, run our first simulation. So the grid that you will be creating this afternoon, you will be using it. Uh, we will create the forcing, we will compile the code, and we will run our first climatological simulation. On Wednesday morning, we are going to do the numerical aspect too. So it's very important. It's because I'm sitting in the class here, and so I can't go to the beach. And I know that there is a cold front that is coming to the, to the beach, and I will need you to forecast uh, when the cold front is arriving. And if I go to the beach on Thursday, will the fronts already have arrived there? So you are going to solve this equation, and it's called the uh, one dimensional advective equation. And after doing that, that will be numerical aspect two, uh, you are going to look at the model output that you got from the day before and using uh, the Crocogi and you will be able to play. So you will have like one hour, one hour and a half to just play with your model output. Uh, in the afternoon, we are going to make a simulation with a zoom inside. So you can change the grid of your parents, okay? And you will decide where to put a zoom inside. And we will do all the work from creating the grid, creating the false impact and running the simulation. On Thursday, we are going to do a game. And for any game, there will be a reward. So we're gonna have candy on, on Thursday. And so um, it's, a, it's gonna be a role game where you're gonna be Croco. And uh, we will uh, review all the files that Croco needs to run, okay? Just to have a very uh, nice review because you are going to deal with a lot of different files, okay? And then you will, be ha you will have some time to make the uh, analysis of your nested simulation from the day before using the Crocogi tools. 
uh, in the afternoon, Thursday afternoon, you are going to run an interannual simulation. So this time you are going to choose a specific period uh, and you can change uh, the area, make a new grid. So make new four things uh, for this file. And so you're going to prepare everything. You launch your simulation and there will be a um, teaching about the notion of uh, optimization for your model to run faster, to uh, um, spend less time to write your output. So a little bit of a class on the parallelization and optimization. On Friday, you are going to put a river in one of your simulations. That's what I said. One of your simulation has to include at least a river. Um, and then in the class, you will have a notion of model validation. As I said, is your model doing a great job? Okay, can you analyze the model output? Can you make any conclusion on the ocean dynamics of your region? So we're going to talk about uh, how to compare your uh, model output to some observation. And in the afternoon, the last, uh, the last class, there will be an introduction to the offline float propagation. Uh, it will uh, end an introduction to the live cocoa, something that I've never used, the live cocoa, so I will discover it at the same time as you. And this um, class will be taught remotely from a lecturer that is in Chile. And so it's the afternoon, so he should be a great time, morning time for him. Okay. And so um, that's it. Maybe uh, is there any question on the things we have seen? Okay. Uh, maybe there are some questions from the remote students. So uh, Jenny Vage is just looking. If you have a question, you can raise your hand. Yeah, but it's already 11 10 and we have to go to the connection. Okay, we do the break and during the break, we discuss. Okay, so now we are. Ah, yes, there is a question in the room. I'm going to repeat the question for the students uh, that are remote. So the question was, if I'm not mistaken, Croco includes or was merged with different model. So do we still, can we still run those model or not? So um, I know for a fact that the model mass, the, the, when you have a model like the Croco model, it solves the primitive equation. And the way it solves the primitive equation are kind of standards. And so the way that um, mass was uh, solving the equation was kind of the same. But mass was including a model that was really important, that is the Mustang model. And so this model has been included inside Croco. So now we are not using Mars anymore because we can only use the Croco model. For the other ones, the Scrum model was really old. It has been improved. It has been reshaped and renamed ROMs. Okay. And then there has been emerging at one point with uh, capabilities to make some nesting. But the ROMs at UCLA still exist. You can run the ROMs at UCLA, but it does not include the Croco tools that will help you to prepare your file. But I know persons that use the Croco tools to create the forcing and then run the ROMs at UCLA because a lot of stuff are still compatible between the models. And then um, the multi-resolution and uh, the multi-resolution is something really new that uh, I've never seen any model including that, any ocean model including that. Uh, Non-hydrostatic, uh, Symphony is a model that exists and is used. So it's, um, we kind of 
copy their model or got the routine and they were included in Coco. So if you had to choose between Symphony and Coco, you would just check the characteristic of the two model and you will um, take the one that uh, can be helpful or the easiest to use. Okay. And uh, I think uh, it's okay. I think it's two way around. Uh, sometimes there are some new uh, numerical schemes that can be developed, but there are publications on those schemes. And so I say modeling is a quite, it's, it's a community. So you share the tools and everything. So when they develop um, still at UCLA, they can be merged inside the Croco because some of the Croco developers are uh, colleagues from the one at UCLI. But uh, for example, in France, uh, there are two uh, main models that exist, which are the Croco and the Nemo model. So they have differences, okay, uh, different uh, grids. And for a long time, the Nemo model uh, did not include the nesting capabilities, but now it has been included. And the coupling with uh, the atmosphere has been developed with Nemo first, and it has been included in Croco after. And so it's the same, depending on the model, uh, you might find some more interesting characteristic in one or in the other one. Uh, we have another question. So my question is uh, related to boxing. Yes. You know that uh, normally uh, the model output, uh, what we got from the model is uh, maybe due also the, uh, due to the boxing. So in uh, mostly in a uh, coastal area, you know that uh, the alteration, even the alteration data are incertain. So how we should be sure that uh, what we have doing is uh, correct or not correct? Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question for the remote students. So it's a question from Serge, who is asking if he wants to develop a configuration in a coastal area. He's questioning the quality of the forcing. Maybe his wind stress forcing is not of a good quality, and what will be the outputs of his model? So I would say that you can choose any forcing you want. Okay, uh, you can. Um, uh, be in touch with people that develop some really uh, coastal version of forcing with, for your specific area. But if it does not exist, you will have to use standard forcing. I mean, uh, wind stress coming from uh, satellite observation, which are not that good along the coast, or um, uh, atmospherical model outputs like uh, ERA-5, for example, but those models does not have a very high resolution, so they are not um, doing a great job for the um, fine scale processes of the atmosphere in the coastal area. So you are going to run your model with the um, uh, fields that you can get, and then you are going to validate your model to be sure that what you are that you are doing in a, is a good thing. Maybe your model outputs or your model configuration is not perfect, but it's the best you can do with it. So you can settle with that, or you can even go and correct your forcing, saying that, for example, along the coasts, when the wind is blowing along the coast, there is a drop off area because the wind is having a lot of friction around um, on the on the land, and there is the amplitude of the wind that drop from the ocean region to the coastal region, and your forcing does not represent that. You can open your forcing file and create a fake um, drop off of your wind, and run your simulation again, and compare to your control run simulation, and see if your model is doing a better job. But the point is, you will see if your model is doing a better job if you compare it to the observation. So at one point, you will have to decide. And sometimes we run the model with biases and say, okay, one degree Celsius biases, 
I can accept it. But if it's three degree, I can't, I need to work on my configuration. So you put your own threshold depending on what you are going to study with it. For example, in my type of research, if I don't have as many eddies as uh, is in reality, or if the eddies as are not at the same time and the same place and in the reality, the processes that are used, they are not linked to these dynamics. So if the um, nonlinear part is not perfect, it's still okay for me. Um, if my salinity is not that good because the uh, runoff of my river uh, is not that good, my research does not really, it's not really important for my research. I know that there will be some nonlinear connection, but I mean, it's the best I can do. Okay. No question from the remote. Okay. Uh, yes, we have a, one more question. Uh, hi, can I ask uh, my question directly? Hi, can I ask my question? Um, Online. For... So the question is, is there any ice in the model? In the Croco model, is no, there is no ice. There is no ice model. But there is... Um, I don't think there is some ice model. Maybe we should ask uh, Rashid that will be there tomorrow. Uh, there have been some coupling with ice model, so the external model with ice, but I've never seen ice inside the cuckoo. So I'm, we're going to ask Rashid tomorrow to be sure of that, because as you've seen, I'm working in the tropical region and there is no ice there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, if you go inside the croco, um, the croco um, uh, routines, uh, the Fortran routines, in the forcing, there are some lines that talk about what should be the, the um, um, fluxes for the salinity above ice. So the, the word ice is written <laughs> inside the code. But in my region, there is no ice, so I don't know. We're going to ask Rashid tomorrow. Yes? Uh, I have a question. Uh, actually, the, the real newcomer question. I'd like to know, uh, I know that you're going to be connected to the property for the next idea. But going forward, let's say, after this, the course, mm -hmm. is it possible to run the model in our own business? Uh, so as I said, uh, so the question is about uh, this week, we are going to connect to the supercomputer at CHPC. And so the question is, what if uh, the student wants to run the model in, on his own computer? So you can, you at the end of the class, you will be able first to copy everything that you have been developing there. You will be able to copy on your laptop. Okay, to um, get everything, the code and the output. Okay. Um, after the class, as I said, there will be a new release of Coco. So I'm just inviting you to wait a few days or a few weeks to download uh, the, the last version of the code. So you will be able to download and to install it on your computer. Okay, but for running the simulation, I, I would say you will, if you run on your laptop that is here, you will have just to be sure to have enough uh, computing power on your laptop to be able to, to solve, to, to run your simulation in a reasonable time. Okay, do not wait one month to run a three month simulation. That's just not doable. So depending on your laptop, you can very easily uh, run a simulation that is like 50 point by 50 point in the horizontal, your, the number of points in your grid, independently of your resolution. You can have 50 point by 50 point for very uh, tiny area or 50 point by 50 point for uh, the tropical Atlantic, okay? But it's only the number of points that will um, 
-hmm. tell how many memories of your computers that will be occupied what is the size of the fields that the model is going to deal with mm -hmm. so that depends only on your computer but there are some hpc facilities like the chpc where or on your own university bigger computer on which you can connect install components so you need to 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 deal with a person of your university and everything as far as i'm concerned i've never run anything on the chpc i'm using one super computer that is in france it's a regional computer so it's not what we call a national computer it's not that big okay uh, i've run um things here in south africa with kind of large well, um, grids like 1000 points by 500 that have been running in south africa but i don't remember the name of uh, the supercomputers that i was using okay. is there any question okay so we're going to do the break now now we're going to do so we're going to do a small break like 10 minute break and we will come back to do our first hands-on session yeah i know that's so okay yeah but don't worry i recover very fast i'm used to teaching um, um,
minutes. Uh, hello, remote students. We are going to start in uh, very shortly our first hands-on session. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share everything. It's easier. Okay. Okay. Oh. So there was one question. Yeah. There was a one question from one participant. Let me find the question again. So there was one question from one remote participant, which was, can Croco, can Croco model be implemented for forecast system, wave dynamic sediment transport? It's a way to force Croco with climate model such, is, is it a way to force Croco with climate model such as RCP scenario for future projection time? Yes, you can do that. Croco with um, the wave dynamics coupling where the sediment transport and everything can be run in a forecast mode. It's going to be a standard run, but the difference is that your forcing will be forecast forcing. So you have to get the uh, forecast forcing from your RCPs scenario. Um, I don't think on the Croco tools there are um, uh, tools that allow to do that automatically. So you will have to download them and make some of the Crocotools compatible to read your uh, input file and create the files that Croco wants to read. And then once you have your uh, um, scenario forcing for Croco, Mustang, Weight Watch 3, you can run a forecast simulation as any other Einkast simulation. Okay. So, um, I will ask everybody in the room not to raise your hand inside the um, the Zoom link, okay? So if you need help or if you have one question, you raise your hand physically. And there is, for the remote students, there is one person that is dedicated to see if you have problems. So if you have a problem uh, remotely, please raise your hand and um, it's this morning, it's gonna be um, Renault person that will uh, be uh, in contact with you. And so do not uh, hesitate to send um, information on the chat. So we are going to try to give uh, Renault a handset. And uh, if you have a one specific question or if you need assistance, uh, Renault will be able to answer directly uh, with his microphone. Okay. Um, let me do that. And so, um, okay. If you are, uh, so you can now go onto the documents and take uh, the first end on session uh, document. In, ca in case you need a headset. So um, the name of the file is create my Croco config tut one. No, it's create Croco config twenty two one environment dot PDF. So we are going to uh, log on the supercomputer. So I'm trying to clean uh, my space. Um, so, oops, we are going to log on to the uh, Lengo computer. So we are going to see how to log on the Lengo computer. And we are going to discover the CHPC cluster. Uh, we are going to copy the Croco and the Croco tools directory on your directory on the CHPC cluster. And we are going to test this mat if MATLAB is working. So when I'm talking now, the uh, files for the tutorial are being distributed to the students that are in person 
here that are here in the room with with me and for the remote student you have to access the pdf file that give all the um the steps but you also have uh, some um help files uh there are three files that are number create my config 2022 and the number zero and it's a summary of the basic line linux command when we are going to be on the supercomputer to change a directory or to copy some file those commands are cd and cp so on the basic linux command sheet i have listed all the commands what they do and i made an example there okay and for the class, we are going to use uh, some uh, softwares. So the first software we are going to use is called Nedit. It just allow you to open an ASCII file, like a file with some model parameter or connection parameter. So you would have to execute something like Nedit file one. We are going to use the CrocoTubes, the MATLAB version. So we are going to use the MATLAB um uh software uh so at any moment or when you are connected you can uh use the matlab soft software freely we as i said this software is not free but we have temporary licenses for each of us for this uh, week for the two weeks okay um then we are going to use uh some uh net cdf uh libraries to see what are in our files okay so these commands uh will be nc dump and there is a graphical tools very uh nice which is called nc view that is free that we are also going to use and uh, we are going to use a uh, um, nco tools to like concatenate files so if we have multi months file and we want to concatenate every month into only one file that contain one year of your simulation we will be able to do that with the nco tools so all those comments will be listed on all the steps of the tutorials there is uh, also uh, page of uh, the Lengo cluster. So the Lengo cluster is a high performance computing uh, for, um, supercomputer that is called Lengo, uh, which means uh, cheetah in uh, Setswana. So it's a petascale system that are uh, a combination of Dell servers. Okay, so let me check. There are something like 1368 computer nodes and each nodes are constituted of 21 cores so 21 processes uh, 24 processes time 1368 you have an idea of the size of the machine we are going to use so when you are going to connect uh, to the supercomputer we are going to use two different file systems that are transparent uh, you end up in your home directory but we are not going to work in our home directory we are going to work on a lustre disk system um, so we will see how to go on the loose system. It's only going into a specific um, uh, directory. Um, uh, when you launch some jobs on a supercomputer, you just don't launch them. You go on a queue and your, your job is going to launch when it's going to be your turn. That is called a scheduling um, software and so the scheduling software is the pbs pro software so we will see the command associated to the scheduling how to send a job how to monitor if your job is still in the queue or if your job is running how to delete your job if you are sure that is not going to work because you discover a mistake okay so we will see that uh, uh, when we go through so uh in the in the um first hand on session 
that you will you will see in your document that there are five different steps okay the first steps is to log on to the hpc cluster that is called lengo so on the screen i'm just displaying the main command that you are going to launch okay but on the uh, pdf the um, tutorials pdf you have an explanation of every line that you do so i would like you to um, look at the step one okay and you have to log in to the lengo cluster using an ssh comment okay so you need a login and a password the login and the password are given in a list that is available in the um, uh, google documents uh, directory that uh, has been given you the address has been given you by jenny there is a, a file in there with your login and the password associated to your login so every login is a student and a number and they should be a password okay so we are about to uh, connect to the hpc so please open your x terminal or your console and just uh, connect to the lengo computer using the uh, ssh minus x you have to put your login um, instead of the word login here okay so you connect you and you just type ssh minus x lengo okay uh, if it's not okay for one of you in the room so i'm handling in the room and uh, rono is handling remote students okay so if in the room somebody did not manage to connect please raise your hand and call a trainer so the login is students and the password is the characters that's associated. We have students here in the rooms that are mixing the login and the password. So the login and the password are in a file that is in the Google Drive that has been sent and it's an Excel file that contains all the login and the password. So I am going to uh, go there uh to go there as well let me uh, just go into my emails there i'm going there and there okay so that that is where the file are okay um so Oh, no. Jenny, Jenny, the file is not there. Who is the login? Yeah, but on the on the Google Drive, the file with the login on it is not there. Okay, but so you have received an email saying where the file is. It's not on the Google Drive anymore. And the link will be sent in the chat right now with your login and password. Sorry, I was going to Here we go. Okay. 
Yes, yes. Uh, you mean the remote? Yes. So you just received by chat uh, the a link to the page where the file is. Yeah, but you don't want me to see the link. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but I want it. Yeah, but I'm not broadcasting it. Okay, so I'm going back there. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. <laughs> no stress, everything is fine. Okay, so if some of you are hanging out and Lengo does not let you connect, you can replace that by SCP here. So any of the two, either Lengo, either SCP, you could you can um, connect. Okay, so there are two comments here. Okay, let me try to connect myself to Lengo. Yeah, uh, for me, it's better working with SCP too. Um, I need to tap yes there. Okay, and if I connect to Lingo, I'm just like that. Okay, so uh, even for me, Okay, so SCP even works better for me. So I'm gonna, let's go with SCP. Oh. So in the mean Okay, in, in the meantime, for those who it's working fine, you can read all the line of step one, okay? And you just have to type LS in your, so you arrive on Lengo, you arrive there, okay? And so it's a Linux system, you see, we don't have like, it's not a Windows system, we don't have Windows, we just have a command line. And if you want to see what's inside our home directory, I'm going to type a Linus command, which is ls, which means list. And there is one file. This file is called lustre. So in some um, 
uh, student accounts, the file does not exist. If the file does not exist, you have to create it. It's not a real file. It's a link to a space in the supercomputer where there is a lustre uh, hard drive system, okay? So it, it's, it's a link to um, a directory, which is MNT, which contain all the directory lustre that contain the users, that contain a directory for your login. And this is, if I want to go into the lustre directory, um, oh, I will just check where I am. So to in Linux, to check where you are, you tap PWD, okay? And it says that here I am in slash home slash S, uh, S I double L I G, okay? It's my home directory. But we don't put anything in our home directory in the supercomputer because we are going to do like big simulation and we are going to generate a big uh, amount of outputs so everything that we are going to do we are going to do in the lustre directory okay um so we have replaced j'ai remplacé tu vois dans la, la truc que ouais, j'ai mis ouais. euh, euh, sur le... chez eux ouais, chez eux ok donc si tu passes d'un truc à un autre tu vas afficher une photo ok 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 so now um so so everybody here please go please the remote student raise your hand to renault if there is a problem so uh, the idea is connecting compared to your pdf it's not doing the ssh on lingo it's doing the ssh on scp so now as i said we don't do anything on your home directory and all the heavy um analysis or computing stuff can't be done on the login node, which is uh, the uh, processes that associated to the login onto the machine. If you try to do, to copy a big directory, your copy will be killed. So now we go to step two. And the step two is, um, we are going to uh, reserve some interactive node. So there will be one node that will be dedicated to your work this morning. So uh, the, there is a, a quite uh, complex command to reserve your node, but don't worry, you don't have to type that. I have created a file that in in the one I've been putting some aliases, okay, it's some shortcuts command that will execute this complex Q sub command in only a uh, small um, command. And so those aliases are uh, contained in a hidden file that is called dot BASHRC. And I have prepared a file for you that is in my Lustre directory, but you have access to it. So you have to copy and paste this CP command. So in Linux, CP means copy. So you copy uh, my.bssshrc to where you are, you are in your own directory. So I put a tiny wave here. The tiny wave means 
in your home directory. So you uh, execute this comment and then you, you're going to activate the script, this hidden script dot uh, PSHRC and sourcing the script. So you have to type source dot BASHRC. And once you have done that, you will be able to execute command like Q sub one or Q sub E I one, which is a shortcut for the long command that is written in the step two of the uh, PDF file. So you have to copy the file, source the file, and execute Q sub I one. And by doing that, you are going to request one processor in one node for you. So when you do that, you might need to wait a few minutes or few seconds to have the processor allocated to you. No, you don't do the orange uh, command, okay? And you, you do the command where you have a little arrows in front. So the command that you do is the big CP command, like, on the screen here and then you execute the alias q sub i1 okay so we'll talk in detail i guess for you guys if you call up the pdf of this then you can just cut and paste mm -hmm. instead of typing that all out right. yeah well it's not that big but, you, know. you you can copy and paste from the pdf okay it might be a little bit easier than typing the big uh, path of my file. Ah. Okay. So I'm displaying on the screen, it's um, the equivalent of your PDF. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so we were in step two. So step two, it's copy the file, source the file, and try and go in the queue to get one dedicated node. Danija, is that working for you? Do, did you get the nodes? Has it been allocated to you, the nodes? You, th these are the commands that you are supposed to execute. You copy, you source. Did you uh, execute Q sub I1? I don't know this one thing on this. It's okay. That's mm. an example. No, it does matter. Uh, the file dot uh, bshrc has to be put in your home directory uh, so nice. because now it's going to be executed at each time step, at okay. each steps. Okay, so, uh, and you see that. I can move it from there. Yes, you you can move it in your home now. Yeah, but put it in your home. Oh, okay. If you copied it in your lustre, you can put it in your home now. Now, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so once you have uh, executed um, the, when you have sources the dot bshrc, you will see that your prompt has changed color. It's now red. So I'm gonna do it. You see. The prompt is red here. Red means danger, danger. Don't do anything. And the next step is requesting a node. So I'm requesting a node. So it's Q sub I1. Okay. And so now I'm on the queue for requesting the node here. 
you can see it. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. And when I'm going to have my node, you will see that my prompt that was red will turn green. Green means it's okay. You can work. Okay. Yes, it takes a few minutes. We, you are in the queue to get an allocated node. So we are not requesting a lot of uh, processes, so it should be quite fast. We, we lost a lot of compute nodes with the load shedding over the weekend. Uh -huh. And they're starting it up again, they're starting the nap the rack up again. Okay. So we should have more resources. Yeah, okay. okay. Okay, so there has been a load shedding this uh this weekend. So there are a certain number of nodes in the Lingo computer that had been shut down. So they are they have been they are being restarted now. Okay. So you see on my screen that now I have my allocated nodes. Now I, I, I can, I have my green uh, prompt here. So it's my login and it gives you the number of the node where I am. I am on node 278. Maybe you are on a different node. Each node contains 24 processors. Okay, maybe you are on the same node as me, maybe not. And I can use exactly the same Linux command. I do ls and pwd and i am in my home directory each time you got um, an interactive node it brings you back into your home directory okay so now we are going to go into the lustre directory so we change directory and we go to the lustre okay so I'm going on to the uh, PowerPoint presentation that presents the, um, the steps. So I have requested the node green here with an alias. And now I go back to my Lustre directory. Is that here I did the Linux command CD and now I'm in Lustre. If I do PWD, I see that I'm in slash home slash SILIC slash Lustre. Um, in fact, I'm not in the home directory, I'm into the loose system now, which is another part of the computer where we can have big outputs or big files. Okay, so I hope that um, everything is fine for our remote students so far. And if it's fine for everyone, uh, I am going to move to step three. So in the class, is that okay to go to step three or is that people that are still stuck to step two that are not being helped? Okay, so we have here in person a few students that need a little bit of help. So I'm going to help them and I'm gonna come back for step three. Thank you. 
Okay, so everyone, now we go to uh, step three, okay? And so the step three is instead of downloading Croco from the website, you are just going to copy the Croco directory in your Lustre directory, okay? You have to be in your Lustre directory and there is a command, okay, where you are going to copy the Croco uh, directory um, that is stored in my uh, directory. There is no enter here, okay? You see that this is only one big line, okay? Just like it is on your PDFs, okay? It's one big line, one big command, okay? So you have to CP minus R, all means we are going to copy a directory and everything that is inside the directory, okay? Be careful to be in your Lustre directory, okay? It's not that big of a directory, but we are working only on the Lustre, okay? So on the Lustre, you execute this copy command, and then you are invited to list what's inside your Croco uh, directory using the Linux command ls. So normally the Croco code is on the web. So I'm going on the web. I type Croco model. Okay, a Croco model. I end up on the uh, Croco Coastal Regional Ocean Community Model website. So it's here. And if you want to download, you click on the download button and you go on the Croco project here. And then you have the possibility to download the stable release version 1.2.1 that has been released in March 2022. We are not exactly using this version for the class. As I said, you have a pre-released version and in a few days, few weeks, we're going to have the release of version 1.3. Okay, so this is what I have been doing. Okay, getting the source codes on, on the Lengo computer but I uh, uncompressed the file that I got, the zip file, I unzipped it and it's in my list directory and you have been copying it, okay? So for you, I prepared uh, this directory which is Croco Training Week directory and in the one you, you have the source code, the Croco directory and you just have to copy it. I already copied it for me. So it's gonna be here in my loose directory. I have a Croco directory. Okay. Okay, so once you have copy, you can do uh, the command on your PDF, which is ls, and then you go inside the directory croco and you can do ls and everything that is in dark blue here it's our directories okay the green file here are uh, programs that you can execute and the black one it's just files okay so there is a readme files a bunch of directory and a program that you can execute 
that we are going to execute this afternoon. But for now, we are not going to execute anything. Okay, so once you have seen that you have everything in your Coco directory, you can go back and into the previous directory, which is cd dot dot to go back and you will be back in your list directory. Okay, so let me just check how many directory we have. So we have an ocean directory. The ocean directory contains the file for solving the primitive equation. It's the Croco code, the ocean Croco code. Okay, then we have an agrif directory, for example. The agrif directory are all the capabilities we need to have a zoom inside our domain. Uh, we have a PSCAS directory. It's a biogeochemistry model or module. Okay, that you can activate with uh, Croco. We have the XIOS to um, better handle the output of the model. Okay, we are not going to use it for this week, but you have access to everything. You have some test cases um, files that are in the test cases directory. There are some scripts that are stored in the directory name scripts, okay? There is a sediment model, Mustang, that is stored inside the Mustang directory. There is a MPI knowledge pre-processing, which is if there are, so we are going to do some parallelization. And if there is one processes that is only dedicated to a land area that has nothing to, to do, it's going to rest and it's not be useful. It can be unplugged and used for the rest of your ocean domain. And that you are going to see it on Thursday afternoon when you are going to do your intraannual simulation. Okay. So um, uh, I'm asking in the, in the room, is there someone for which that it's not working? You have copied the Croco directory listed. So now we go directly to step four. Step four, we are doing exactly the same, but we are going to go for the Croco tools. So please don't go, don't continue to look at me, please. Um, here on the download page of Croco, uh, you have the Croco tools stable release version 1.2. Um, it's basically what we have. We have changed tiny, tiny bits somewhere that will be released in the uh, release 1.3. So if you click on the link there, oh, it's not what I want. Uh, sorry, it's, uh, it's with the Croco tools. There are some MATLAB utilities and data sets that I have downloaded. I didn't have to use the utilities, but only the data sets. So if you download the Croco tools, only the Croco tools, it goes without any data sets, so it's not very heavy in terms of a file. But if you want to create some full thing, you will have to have some uh, data sets. So in, if you click here, you can have data sets for your topography, for example. Okay, so you have access to um, an atlas of topography that is called Etopo2. Okay, it's a two minute uh, topography resolution. You can have uh, the World Ocean Atlas 2009. The World Ocean Atlas is an atlas that contains ocean variable everywhere in the world, but it's a climatology. You can't run an interannual inter simulation on a particular period. It's just some, uh, an average of months of January, February, March, and December. Uh, there is another one, which is a CARS 2009. So it's the same atlas, but the CARS is developed by uh, Australian and World Ocean Atlas is developed by Americans. Okay, so it's two different climatology. Ask me which one is better. I will tell you, run the two simulation and compare with the observation, okay? Um, you have the Quads uh, 2005. This one will contain some surface forcing. So now if you go to uh, copying the directory onto your computer, you will directly copy um, the my uh, CrocoTools directory that already includes the data sets you need. 
Okay, so it includes the cause, the world ocean atlas, the codes, the climatology, it includes rivers. I have just some uh, uh, directories that I have not copied, like what do I have that I have not copied? I have not copied the GOT 99, which is has something to do with tides. So we are not dealing with tides, so I didn't copy this one. I did not copy the World Ocean Atlas PSCAS because for this week, we are not going to use the PSCAS Atlas. We are not going to use some biogeochemistry, okay? So this directory uh, now that contains the data set is slightly heavier than only the Cocoa tools. So it can take a bit of time to copy into your Lustre directory. So please execute this CP command. So it's only one big line, okay? And be careful, you have to be in your Lustre directory. If you do LS, you should see that your Croco directory is just next to it, okay? And then at the end, when you type LS, you should see Croco and Croco Tools directory in your Lustre directory. Okay, so once you have copied your Croco Tools directory, you can go inside your Croco Tools by typing the Linux command CD Croco Tools. Okay, and then you can list what are inside the Croco Tools. So it's a bunch of directory in blue. Some files you can execute in um, in green, and some um, ASCII file or text file that are in black. So just picking some file randomly. There is a directory that is called nesting tool. It contains all the files, you, all the routine you need to create a forcing for uh, Zoom, for example. We have the river directory that contains all the files that will be necessary to uh, create the runoff forcing for your simulation. Uh, we have a directory that contains pre-processing tools uh, that's where you are going to make the, that where are the routine to make your grid, to make your surface forcing or boundary forcing. The ones that start with a big A, it's A4, CFSA, ECMWF, ERA5, NSAP, are directories that will be dedicated for interannual simulations. Okay, different uh, sources from the atmospheric data, different models. So it could be the CFSR model, or it could be the ERA-5 uh, outputs from the European Center, okay? Uh, similarly, there is an O-Force OGCM, which be to create the boundary condition for the interannual forcing, okay? So we will, you will see that on Thursday, okay? So there is only diagnostic tools, there are tides, there are to uh, towns, Okay, there are some visualization tools. So it's a bunch of tools and everything here, it's written in MATLAB, okay? It's MATLAB tools. And uh, there is um, um, another part in the Croco tools, which contain exactly the same routine, but coded in Python. And as I said, MATLAB is not a free software. Python is a free software, okay? Um, so um, if it's okay for everyone. Uh, did everybody manage to copy the Cocoa Tools? Okay, let me check. Um, Okay. 
Can you retry? Okay. Uh, be careful. You have to download the Croco tools from the directory that contain two underscore Croco tools. Okay. If you download it from somewhere else, should be the same. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know. You copy. I, I copy, but you could have it to download it somewhere. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, no, 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 no. If you copied from somewhere else on my list directory, it should be the same. Well, copy from one. From what? So one, and then I have to put them you have to put it on the top of Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's Ah, yes. Yes, but I think I might. Okay, okay. Don't worry. Yeah. Are you going to catch up? Um, Uh, can I ask everyone to remove your Croco Tools directory? Okay. okay. It's RM minus R Croco Tools. Okay. You are in a loose directory. You type RM minus R Croco Tools. Okay. I'm just, uh, just verifying something. Okay. And so from now, uh, look where I am. Am I okay? I'm in um, MNT uh, Lust User S E League uh, Croco Training Week One Cro Two Underscore Croco Tools. And there, there is a Croco Tools that you have to copy. Copy it from now here on your Lust directory. I just change a tiny file just now inside okay copy this one please Okay, I remove everything and you can only access to this one. Sorry. Just one second. There is a thing. Just, just, just wait a few seconds. There is a here in the directory.
there is a step here, two underscore croco tools that you have to put. There is a mistake on the printed version. Okay, it has been corrected. It is corrected for the for the remote. Okay, but it has been printed bad. There is this here uh, inside the croco training week. There is a two underscore croco tools. Okay. Now, now I put both versions, okay? So I'm going to go ahead for the uh, last step. That uh, if you if you are stuck with your copy, please just listen to me to be ready to do step five when you have finished to do step four. Okay, so just listen to step five. To do the step the step five, just testing if the software MATLAB is going to work. 
Okay, so we are going to um, start MATLAB uh, wherever you are, but please stay in your Lustre directory. Okay, um, but we are going to execute the script. Okay, but you don't have any MATLAB script there. So I created two, uh, one script and one tiny data sets that are in my directory, uh, in the uh, directory uh, three some files, okay? Or the, those two files, they start with a TP0. And so I want to copy the file with TP0 star. So it's every file that begins with TP0 star, okay? So you do this copy, okay? And then, uh, you can ls what you have, list what you have. So you have your Croco directory, your Croco tools directory, and you have my two extra files. The .m file is a MATLAB script, and the .nc file, it's a netcdf file that contain a little bit of data. And then you have to start MATLAB by typing the command MATLAB space, no desktop, okay? Because we don't want to have a big uh, popping window, okay? So we don't have the MATLAB desktop. We're gonna to continue to type on the command line and you see that on the uh, PDF, I changed the color. So now when you have started MATLAB, we go on a yellow, okay? And all the comments, so you can still have access to some Linux command like ls, okay? And then you're gonna execute the TP0 test script. And if everything is working and you have the X server working, you're gonna have a pop-up window with a smiling face, okay? And once you have a smiling face, oh, you're gonna go and get lunch, okay? <laughs> and so when you have your you know, smiling face, you can remove those two files using the remove command or M once you have exited MATLAB, okay? And then you can exit everything and give, give back your uh, computing nodes, your interactive computing and exit from the Lengo computer, have lunch, and then we're gonna come back for the uh, afternoon hands-on session.
Mas não está acostumado a dizer que é que tinha esse tipo de flor que eu não estava na sua So the last is exit, 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 and then you can have lunch. But I couldn't love it in my own my No, 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 Okay, so pronounce it weirdly. If you haven't manifested, you can have it. Thank you. Perfect. 
Can you understand? Uh, for the remotes, we're gonna go and have lunch, and uh, we will be uh, Jenny. Jenny, when are we gonna be back? Okay. Yeah, but that's for the remote. What do you do? Two, two, two. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna be for, for the remote. We're gonna be back at two, two p.m. Okay, in one hour. Yeah, that's the 
Yeah, but I, I use that. Yeah, I use my words. Yeah. yeah, but they see what I'm talking about. I'm going to open up the next one. Tutorial. Two kids. So they need to reconnect and immediately, and immediately to launch to survive. Yeah. No, 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 nobody slept well, but they had lots of big party on okay. Saturday, and so then we went to bed like two. Because Anthony, my husband, was not there because he was at the party. He put them home. And so. No, we are not gonna. They can't complain. They were at the party. Now, now if they are tired, it's because they were at the party. So I'm going to do
Okay, so um no, maybe I'm on mute here. Uh, so we are going to uh, start the afternoon session. And uh, during this session, we are going to make our first trip. So as I said this morning, you will be able to choose any region of the world that you want. Um, and one of your three regions has to contain a river. So it can't, it's not mandatory that it's the one of today, okay? So uh, first I'm gonna talk a bit, a bit about the grids of COCO, how COCO is working, and then we are going to go in the hands-on session. So there for models, there exist two types of grids, okay? So you have the, un the structure grid, okay? They do not have to be square or rectangle, okay? It can sample a spheric world using this kind of um, grid cells, okay? And there are uh, some unstructured grids that are based so on some triangles like this one. And the size of the triangles can vary when you get close to an island like this one. Okay. And so uh, these type of grid are using mostly for the tidal modeling or for some engineering applications. For the croco grid, we are using um, this kind of regular grid okay and so this is a grid of 
um, croco. It's called an Arakawa sea grebe because you will see that all the variables, they are not at the same place in the grid. So if it's a grid cell here, in the middle of the grid cells, you will have the traces like temperature, salinity, density, the sea level that are defined here in the center of the grid. If you have one value, for example, temp te temperature equal to 23.62, it means that all the temperature within this square is 23.62, okay? All this volume of water have exactly the same characteristics, okay? And the current, the zonal current, will be shifted to the east or to the west, depending on how you see it. The U point will be at the boundary of the grid cells here to, to um, represent exactly what's entering the tracer cell like what's going to be advecting through uh, the current in terms of temperature or salinity. If you have a current that goes uh, from the west to the east that's going to transport um, water here that is colder, it's going to enter this cell and the process uh, will be the zonal advection. So the U points are at the um, zonal boundaries. The V point for the meridional current are on the top and the bottom, okay, on the south and on the north of the trace of points, okay. So you will see that when you have your full grid, so let's imagine that my rectangle, I have a rectangle domain, okay, and you will see that so the tracer are here, the round point in the middle of the cell. And the U point, they are the square there, the cross there, okay? And so you have, if, if we count the number of points, let's count the number of tracer points in the X direction. We have one, two, three, four, five, six points. And if I count the number of points for the U grid, I count the crosses, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven i have one more point for for the u so my u grid will have one more point than my tracer grid and the tracer grid uh with a, within the croco um vocabulary is called the raw grid where we have the density point rho being the uh, density okay and now if you look at the grid and the square are the position of the meridional current. So you have each time you have a cell, you have points in the south and in the north. Again, if I count the number of raw points, I have one, two, three, four points in the meridional di direction. I have one, two, three, four, five points for the V grid in that direction. But you will see that in the zonal direction, the V grid has the same number of points than the raw grid. Okay, and the V points, they have uh, the U point have the same number of points as the raw grid in the meridional direction. So once you're gonna have your grid, um, you're gonna have a grid for the raw point, for the U point, and for the V point. It's gonna be in your net CDF file. Okay, and you will see that depending on the number of points, you will have some extra point for you in the zonal direction and some extra point for V in the major meridional direction, okay? Uh, so that's for the spatial. And for the vertical, uh, if you look at this diagram, it represents how is the vertical grid inside the croco. Uh, we have some question inside the room. Yes, uh, we are coming back to the uh, horizontal grid. Uh, question would be how we choose which point are on the raw grid. Why? Um, so this we we are going to talk about this on Wednesday. We are going to see um, the discretization and how the equation are 
adapted to have uh, to divide on in in terms of grids because what we have seen this morning in our equation is that we have some derivative the first one we have is du over dt which is how the current will evolve into time but if you look again into your equation you have some zonal variation like du over dx okay or dt over dx the variation of temperature um, over x and this grid has some advantages depending on the processes that you are looking at if it's some large scale uh, geostrophic processes or not so it has a lot of advantages for everything that is advection because at the end so you have this grid and if you code your equation into this grid, if you have a, a dt over dx, uh, you're going to take a point here, that is a point t, and here a, another point t, and dt over dx, you are going to use the difference between these two points. So using the difference, it's like you are going to average some information between two points. And the thing is, you want to limit the number of averages that you are going to do. So on Wednesday morning, we are going to see different grids because this is a uh, Arakawa C grid, but we are going to see the B grid and another grid just and code some simple equations on those grid and see how many times we have to average and see which processes are best resolved on this particular grid. Okay. So going back to the vertical grid, on this schematic here, it's the way of the, how the Crocker grid is designed on the vertical. So you see that the level are here, it's a line. They follow the topography on the bottom. It's what we call the sigma coordinates. And but they also follow the sea level on the top of the ocean. It's very different compared to what we call the Z coordinate grid, which has a certain number of vertical level. You see, they can be irregular, but if you have, let's say, 40 points in your vertical, if you want to look at the coastal area, you won't have 40 points to describe the variability here. And a lot of stuff is happening on the coastal area. On contrary, the Crocker grid, if you have 40 level to describe the water column from the surface to the bottom on the deep ocean, you still have 40 vertical level to describe the variability here in the coastal region from the uh, sea level to the bottom. So it has some advantages to be able to better resolve the area where you have a shallow ocean. If in your domain, you also have area where your ocean is deep, okay? Well, on Wednesday morning, we will see one disadvantage, one disadvantage uh, to have this kind of grid, okay? So the sigma coordinate is so the same that we have um, two, uh, type of points inside the vertical grid we have the place where we have um the uh, zonal current and the traces uh they are here in the middle of a grid cell here on this layer it's everything uh, temperature uh, salinity density still uh, here and on the side you have the zonal current and on this side you have the meridional current but the vertical velocity is shifted it's on the top of the grid cell okay and so the vertical velocity will go from the surface to the bottom and in between of two points you will have the density and the current point so you have one extra point for what we call the W grid in the vertical compared to the row grid in the vertical, okay? So if, for example, you want 37 vertical levels for the temperature, you will have 38 vertical level for the, um, the vertical velocity. And the vertical velocity will be zero at the bottom of the ocean. As I say, it's a boundary condition. No water is coming from below or no water is going inside the sand okay and so how 
do we do uh, this uh, sort of grid? So this is an example of one formulation of the vertical grid and where you see H here at the bottom topography. So here you have the bottom topography and the function will be um, designed such as, such as the vertical level will follow the, the bottom topography. You also have here the data here at the sea level. So it will, the, the vertical level will also uh, follow the sea level in the surface. And then you have this uh, sigma here. It's a sigma coordinate. So if you have uh, 37, vertical, uh, 37 vertical levels, this sigma is something that is very regular. It starts at minus one at the bottom of the ocean. It finishes zero on the top of the ocean, and it needs to have 37 points in, B, in total on this column, okay? It's the regular vertical sigma coordinates. But then we have a stretching function that will say we want more level in the surface uh, layers, for example, because a lot of things are happening at the surface. So you want to put more vertical levels to describe your surface. Or on contrary, you are very interested by the bed layer of your ocean and the interaction with sediment and current. And on contrary, you would like to increase the resolution at the bottom. And you, for that, you can play on two parameters. Theta B is to uh, increase the stretching on the bottom layer. And theta S is for S, um, increasing the stretching on the surface layer. So S is for surface, B is for bottom. Okay, so we are you. I'm gonna give you a um, small uh, MATLAB function. Once you have created your grid, you choose a certain number of vertical level. For now, you are not going to modify the stretching parameter, just keep them as they're gonna be. And then you will be able to play with those parameters to see what they do. Okay, so if you choose a place, you will choose the topography so that you can't play with it but you will be able to you will be able to play with the theta s theta b there is another parameter that is called hc it's a, a positive parameter that helps to play with the thickness of the stretching so you will be able to play with this parameter too okay so today we're going to concentrate only on making the grid and analyzing those parameters for the vertical grid, and you will choose any place of the words that you want. So you choose the horizontal and the vertical. Okay, so we are going to begin our hands-on session. So for the uh, person in the room, the papers have been distributed in the morning. Okay, and for the persons that are remote, the paper are available on the Google Drive. Okay, so we go with a tutorial two. And so the, uh, what we are going to do is um, create an horizontal and vertical grid, and then we're gonna make our own, own you gonna make your own uh, grid configuration. And so the first step is logging back onto the supercomputer as you did this morning. You remember that we don't put Lengo here, it's better if you put SCP instead of Lengo there, okay? So please go on your computer and you can follow the steps of uh, the hands-on session two, step one, which is logging onto the supercomputer and uh, reserving one interactive processor. And then you go directly into your Lustre directory. Uh, and then I need to apologize because I say Lustre, List is very French, so it's kind of a, um, an alias, and you have to understand luster, something like that. <laughs> I'm not sure. So I'm going to say lustre, and then you're going to translate, please. Okay, so you can go ahead, and um, we have one more person that's going to help us. Uh, it's um, uh, Guillaume Morvan that just arrived from his plane this morning, that he's here, so a new trainer to. Um, help us during the hands-on sessions.
and he's going to do the interannual simulation on Thursday afternoon. Yes, and the last one was the yeah. yeah. so someone who wasn't going to be in person. Oh, they can. But he has to go and uh, yeah, but it's not complete. So I'm only getting it. Maybe they're going to ask it. The PDF, and I'll make a comment to them. Tu vois, je les tape à la main en vrai, donc je vais, je vais le corriger chez moi.
You know, Jenny, it seems to be okay. It's well. No, I think we got the complete statue. So we don't know what she's doing. We have to create a bash and then create that and then do the statue. And then the statue, step four, and step five. I think you can do that too. Um, we can do it online. So, okay, so it's fine. Okay. But this one is fine. But some need to work with this one. Yeah, so I don't know if that was a tiny mistake here. No, I ah. don't Yeah, but it's it's uh, for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we Yes, So um, I'm gonna. Can you? Can you? Can I have your attention? I'm going to explain what we are going to do in step two. Okay. So in step two, we are going to go in our Croco directory. And if you remember this morning, there was one script that was green, which means it was something that we can execute. And this script, this script is called create config dot bash. Okay. So you are be if you read your tutorial too, you are going to be asked to open it. Okay. So to open this file, there are two possibilities. Either you are an expert and you use the Linux command vi. Okay. So it will open on your terminal, or you open a window and using the software nedit. Okay. So it's nedit followed by the name of the script that you want to open. Okay. So in this script, we are going to ask you to um, rename a directory and uh, it's going to be the run Benguela LR. So Benguela LR means Benguela low resolution. 
It's a standout configuration that is around the coast of South Africa in the South Benguela. It's a uh, configuration that is, ha has been developed years ago by Pierrick Penven. Uh, he has a paper published in 2001. And it's kind of a test case. Each time you begin with Croco, all the uh, parameter files belong to this grid. If you don't do anything and you just press the MATLAB buttons of the Croco tools, you're going to end up with all the files of the Benguela low resolution, the grid, the forcing, everything. Okay. So we are first going to do this uh, grid, the same grid as the Benguela low resolution. So you practice on this grid and then um, we, you are going to, re to come back to step two and do your own grid. So step two is just preparing your work directory. You, you're going to execute just create config. It's going to prepare a directory for you. OK. And then um, I'm just thinking of something. And then uh, in your work directory, you're going to run MATLAB, execute the grid, look at the grid. And once you are satisfied with everything, you ask as many questions as you want, you will come back to step two and you will call your configuration run clean. Everything is written. And there you choose the region you want. Okay. So you go, you now you are on your own to do the step two using the PDF. You are there and you, we are here in the room and there, and we are checking for the remote student at the same time. And so you have to go and uh, look at the create config bash and follow the instructions that you have on your hands-on session PDF. Okay, can go ahead. So at the end of step two, really the end, you have to copy one MATLAB script that has been especially designed for this class, okay? So it's in my 
are Lustre directory, and you have to copy it in your run Banguela low resolution directory to be able to play with this MATLAB script. Okay, so it's the last line, the orange line, once you have uh, created your your run directory. Uh, at the in when you're going to create your run clean directory, if you want to inspect your vertical um, the vertical grid, you will have to copy again this uh, script in your new directory. So once when you have finished with step two, you can go ahead and go to step three. And the step three is you're going to execute MATLAB. And so at one point, you're going to edit the Croco Tools param. 
and makes the grid. Are you on Lengo or on the XG? Yeah. 
Well, it seems uh, working, so yeah. I think that it is a good uh, solution. Yeah. And there is no problem with the online. Uh, so far, this is good. And Redo even asked. Okay. Thank 
En fait, j'ai un étudiant qui n'arrive pas à faire uh, ah, sorry. I have a student. Yeah, there is a student that can't do the horizontal section. Um, and create. Yes, I accept. Okay. Yes, I know what Christmas Mais c'est la même, oui, parce qu'on utilise tout pareil. Uh, 
Um, are you having any technical difficulties yourself? Me, no, everything's working by me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, can I have your attention, please? Okay, um, I hope that everything is okay, but we have a lot of trainers. They're going to come to you if something is not working. Okay, can I please have your attention? It's important that technically it's working, but also that you understand what you are doing. Okay, right. so once you have created the Bengala low resolution grid, you just have to type make grid. You don't do fancy stuff. We are going to recreate the Kirik Penven grid. Okay. And then I ask you to run the script that is named draw zonal section. Okay. What does this script do? It's going to take your ROM tools param. Okay. Where are the parameters of your um, grid for now? Since the ROM tools param will be the main file where all the parameters for your configuration will be uh, decided, where you are going to put the parameters you want. So if I go on the uh, supercomputer here, and so here I can edit the uh, Proco tools param. The Proco tools param, okay. We're going to see all the parameters that belongs to uh, the Benguela low resolution grid. So you just have to check the first section, which is the configuration parameter. So it's kind of intuitive, okay? You can choose any title that you want. And here you have the longitude minimum, maximum, lat min, lat max, okay? And then the number of vertical level is 32. The resolution is one third of a degree. And here you have the parameter for the vertical grid, the stretching, okay? So now I'm gonna explain those parameters. So the first one, theta s, it's a stretching for the surface, okay? So the, this parameter does not have a unit or anything. You can just plot and see what you have, okay? And, um, there is a theta b here too. So we just see that it's less than seven. So we just um, stretch less on the bottom than what we do on the surface. And we have an hc, as I said, it's a positive parameter, a thickness, which is 200 meters, okay? And we have a v transform equal to two. So this is really important. V transform equal to two, it means that we are in the, new grid vertical coordinates, a new vertical coordinates, because there are two vertical coordinates that exist, two way of doing the stretching. The two ways, it's two different formulas that do the stretching on the vertical, okay? They have both of, both formulation are quite complicated and they are different, but they have the same number of parameters, which are uh, four parameters, okay? Tita S, Tita B, H C for the thickness, and you have to choose which transformation you want. Okay, the first one or the second one. The so first one is the old one. The second one is the new one. But it's not like with the phone. Okay, it's not that it's better. It's different. I know a lot of users that prefer the new formulation. I just say plot what you obtain and choose the grid you prefer, okay? And um, I'm gonna go on the next uh, parameters uh, a little bit later in the week to explain what are those parameters, okay? Uh, let me go to the end. Okay, so nothing more there. 
And so uh, it, once you have uh, done your bridge, you have this script with draw zonal section. The draw zonal section is just gonna plot what you have. So if you don't put any parameters, it just plot what you have on your ROM tool span, the number of vertical level, the theta s, theta b, everything. Okay. If you want to increase the vertical level, it's just on the plot that you are going to do. You, this script is not going to change your ROM tool span. So you're going to play with the parameters and each time looking at what does your vertical level look like if instead of having a theta s of seven you put a theta s of 100 how would it look like you just play with the parameters but you don't you don't change anything in the grid that you have created or in your ROMs to span so if there is a one combination of number of vertical level theta s theta v that you like then you have to come back to your ROMs to span change the parameter and make your grid again okay and so now I'm going to talk about uh, the two different formulation. Okay. So V transform equals to one. So the old formulation, you see the stretching function. It's uh, for the person who really likes the hyperbol hyper hyperbolic functions, sine and cosine and tangent. Okay. But the thing is, you have something that is one minus theta b and the rest is theta b so for the first formulation theta b is not a stretching parameter if you choose for example theta s equal to six you you're going to stretch in the surface and if you choose theta b equal to one you choose it's going to be the same okay so theta b can vary between zero and one if you choose zero means you want no uh, stretching at the bottom. Everything's going to be stretched at the surface. If you choose one, it's going to be, I want as stretch as the bottom that I have on the surface. Okay. So for the V transform equal to one, theta B is between zero and one. If by mistake you put theta B equal to six, you can have vertical levels that are below the topography. But as I say, if you play with draw zonal section, you are just playing with the plot. You are not doing anything wrong on your ROM to spell. It's just plotting the stuff. Now, the new formulation, V transform equals to two. Now we have the hyperbolic cosine inside the um, stretching function. And for this one, theta B is independent of theta s. Both of them are independent uh, stretching parameters, okay? So you can choose seven for the surface and 10 for the bottom, okay? You don't have this zero, one um, symmetry for, the, for theta b. Theta s and theta b can be chosen. But when I say they are independent, not so much, because if we say, for example, we have 32 vertical level, and I do a very big stretching uh, in the surface. So among my 32 vertical level, I have, let's say, half of them, 15, that are in my surface layer 100 meters. Okay. They are very stretched at the surface. But now I say, okay, but I want to stretch two in the bottom. So I stretch two in the bottom. So I can't have uh, uh, 15 levels at the surface nothing in the middle and 15 level in the back in the in the bottom so choosing the same um stretching at the surface and the bottom i will have to dedicate some of my 15 level to the bottom too so you will see that if you change the t tab it will also change the number of levels that you can uh take to um, describe your surface level, because at the end, you have decided that you have only 32 level. So you have only those one that you want to describe your water column, okay? So they are not independent, but it's just like the parameters inside the function in the second formulation are independent. In the first formulation, theta b is between zero and one, okay? This information is noted nowhere, 
Okay, so you can just put them on your paper. If you choose V transform equal to one, you have theta V between zero and one. And if you mess up, you will see that your, your drawing will be strange, okay? So let me do a drawing. Uh, just I have a zonal section, basic zonal section, and this is a drawing that I'm going to have. So this is a topography along the Benguela. So here it's Africa, here it's the ocean. And the topography is a dark line on the bottom. And the uh, vertical level are the one of the raw grid, okay? And they describe the, the, the water column from the bottom to the um, surface, okay? So here on the basic parameters, I have 32 vertical levels. My theta S is seven, seven. My theta B is two. I'm on a V transform number two. HC equal 200. This is what I have, okay? Um, and so if I want to increase the number of vertical level, I put 64, for example, I will get a new uh, plot with 64 vertical levels. And, but it doesn't change anything to my grid. It's just a plot, okay? But maybe now I say, okay, 64 seems really better. So now I'm gonna go and change my ROMs to Spara, okay? So now you can continue your, um, and all the formulas for the stretching and everything, they are on the website of Croco. Okay, so if you go on the website of Croco and you go on the documentation, there is a section that is for the vertical grid and you have all the formula that are here, what the parameters are doing. And one last thing is here, I don't know what my sea level is. So in the formula, because as I said, the vertical level describe from the bottom to the uh, sea level but I don't know what my sea level is. So I put a zero for my sea level. So in this plot, I have a zero. For the model, when the model is going to run, it's gonna go to the actual sea level of the model, okay? So you can continue up. And so once you have finished the uh, Benguela, you go back to step two and three and you just spend your time to design your configuration, okay? There are restrictions on the number of points uh, and don't go to the equatorial region. You can cross the equator, but you have to cross this by more than two degrees.
When you want to do the organization, in case you are in Qatar and in Hamas, each time you have to type thought, okay? So in this thought, it's going to be from past, just for Qatar to say, where are the, the food? So the food are in the territory for the food. So you don't need to go for the food, so you have to do all the places to go to the food. So you can where are the food? So each time you use uh, the problem is in mathematics is in the Bible. Yes, so what is your um yeah it's a little bit so One thousand is like mm, 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 Yes, yes, Thank you. 
Okay. So um, at one point here, I asked you to go onto your onto the data to do for work in the portfolio as well in NCC uh, with NCU, which is this government system. You are seeing that the topography is global. So you can choose any region you want, and you have enough data that is the best for the government. Okay. Uh, just one thing, okay? You remember I say when you are uh, connected on the supercomputer, if you are not on a dedicated node, uh, your prompt is um, red. Red mean I don't do anything. 
I just reserved an interactive note. So don't forget to do the Q sub I one, okay? And so you will see on your um, PDFs, on your um, tutorials, that everything that is on the frontal node, it's on a blue rectangle with a penguin, okay? When you are connected on the uh, interactive node, all the rectangles are in green. And when you are connected on MATLAB, it's uh, yellow, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can't, you should not mix up what you do on MATLAB and what you do on the node, and you don't do anything on the frontal node, okay? Thank you. 
Can I have your attention, please? Uh, so you have been creating a run uh, Benguela low resolution directory or a run clean directory. The question is, what is inside this directory? Okay. So the main file in which you are going to put all the parameters of your configuration when you are going to make uh, the forcing, the grid file and everything are in the file that is named Croco Tools Param. Okay, so you see this file. It's here in your run directory. It's the one that is Croco Tools Param on my screen is just there. Okay, so the thing that you have seen in the tutorial is that all the files that will be created for your configuration, they're going to be stored here in the directory Croco file. Okay, so for now, you have only one file, the Croco tools param and the Croco file directory. There is also the start.m, the one that you always execute when you open MATLAB to do some uh, Croco stuff. Okay, you always begin by typing start and start is here. The other file, the dot h, the bash, the croco.in, we are going to use them when we are going to compile the Croco and launch Croco. Okay. So for today, we have the start, the Croco tools param.m, and the directory Croco files. Okay. And the one thing I want to show you is that when you execute create config.bash, I'm going to open the create config.bash. And so here you changed the name of your directory. So it was in the line uh, 30, okay? And you see that in the line 40, there are some options, okay? And it's the options that's gonna decide what is going to go into your run directory. For example, if you want to put some, do some forecasts, there are some forecast scripts that exist, okay? And you would have to add some uh, other uh, names here. And the list of the name is below, okay? Uh, so you have Ocean Dev, which is classic when you do Croco, you always put it. Uh, Ocean Prod, uh, it's when you are going to do um 
the developing stuff. If you want to do some PSCAS, you're going to add the PSCAS keywords. If you want to do some agriff, you're going to put the agriff keywords. So our keywords are ocean dev, agriff, inter, and pre pro, because we are going to, we need stuff for the ocean. Pre pro is because we need stuff for the pre processing, like start.m, proco tools param.m. So having this keyword, this script is going to copy the things that we want inside our run directory. We have inter because Thursday you're going to do interannual simulation. We have, we have agriff because Wednesday we are going to do a nesting. Okay. And so if you don't want to, um, I, I kind of selected the file that I wanted. The most common option is all dev. And you have a bunch of files that you are not going to use, but you have everything. So just for you not to have too many files, I just selected a few of them. But if you open this file, when you download from internet, from when you download Coco, you're going to get an old dev, which is Ocean Dev, XIOS, Test Case, Agris, Inter, Forecast, Peace Case, Sediment, Mustag, Ocean, Ocean Analysis, and Pre-Pro. So you see that I have been reducing the number of keywords because we don't need everything for this week, okay? You just one tiny difference between when you download and what you execute here, okay? So once you design your grid, you see that you when you do make grid, you have an LLM and NMM. Is that you would like to have a reasonable number of points for the for the class, okay? So now something like one hundred by one hundred identity. 120 mm -hmm. it's gonna go okay okay it's not like 1000 by 1000 okay try to be in the middle but you can do a little bit more than one Yeah, if you don't choose to be the you to Yeah. Yeah. 
So when you make your grief, be careful not to you have like half your grief inside the lady. Okay. You want to have a, a lot, you don't you, you don't want to lose some consciousness uh, uh power because it's not in the land. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's good. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, so uh, I hope that uh, remote students are doing okay. I'm going to turn off my computer and uh, the class is starting tomorrow at 9.30. <laughs> Have a nice evening, everyone.